warm welcome to the morning. And uh, it's really a, a privilege to have Professor Pratap Banu Mehta today to talk to us. I just wanted to say a few things about the memorial lecture. This is the fourth lecture that we are conducting. With a small break in between, uh, well, two years actually, uh, when the COVID pandemic uh, struck. And this was, we didn't want uh, online more there. It's so much nicer doing it with all of you present. And so uh, there was a short break. But, uh, the first lecture was uh, given by uh, Gopal Gandhi. And uh, that was followed by Ashish Nandi. And then uh, in 2019, we had TM Krishna. Then the, this gap, and so we are really fortunate that uh, Sir Pratap Bhandu agreed to raise the occasion and share his thoughts. Um, let me just read a small introduction, although uh, most of you is such a well-known person. Uh, Pratap Banu Mehta is one of our foremost intellectuals political scientist and philosopher by training, he writes with incisiveness, sensitivity, and a deep sense of commitment on a range of issues on politics, history, and society. He is contributing editor to the Indian Express, where he writes on a range of topics that are contemporary and with great clarity. His writings often make one sit up and rethink on matters we, we may have often formed careless opinions about. He has been on the editorial boards of several journals in India and globally and is currently teaching a semester every year at Princeton in the Department of Politics. He has served in the past as Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University and was President of the Center of Policy Research. <coughs> and a member of the National Knowledge Commission. I think it was in 1996, 2004. Okay. Uh, he has received several awards and honors, including the Malcolm Adisheshaya Award and later the Infosys Prize. Uh, it is indeed an honor that you are here with us to deliver the URA Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> so, uh, just a couple of announcements before we start, but uh, I would like uh, Amma uh, to present a bouquet. <laughs> Let me call upon uh, today's speaker to deliver the URA Memorial Lecture, fourth lecture. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, it's truly a great privilege uh, to be able to speak uh, on this occasion in memory of uh, one of India's literary, political, intellectual treasures, uh, Professor U. R. Murthy, or as he used to be known in Delhi, U. R. A. Uh, affectionately, everybody in Delhi calls him U. R. A. for some reason. Uh, and I'm deeply grateful to the Anand Murthy family uh, for the warmth, hospitality, and for more importantly, for their commitment to keeping alive the literary traditions, the political ideals uh, that Professor Anand Murthy stood for uh, all his life. And that I think are probably even more relevant now, perhaps, um, than was the case uh, a few years ago. I must also confess I'm feeling a little bit inadequate on this occasion, uh, partly because when I just heard the list of speakers who have preceded me, uh, if I, I somehow feel the standards are coming down, Sharad. You um, are left such a towering legacy that I think anybody who speaks in his name or any occasion connected with their name, I think will feel the burden of that excellence. 
uh, I was also quite intimidated by the fact that this is Bangalore, where you typically get a incredibly learned, sophisticated uh, crowd, and I think the gathering of uh, uh, some of the best kind of people who've engaged with Kannada literature in recent years, uh, some of them in this audience, um, certainly I think is, a, is disconcerting to an outsider like me. But most of all, because I've decided to be a little bit reckless today. And I've decided to be reckless in one very specific sense. When Sharath asked me to speak on this occasion, I was thinking of, okay, what might be an appropriate subject matter that both speaks to Professor Anand Murthy's legacy and the times we live in. And the topic I chose, hence the title, which is Culture and Identity in a Politicized Age. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is use your Anand Murthy's critical writings, and some of his novels, but mostly his critical writings, to offer some contemporary reflections on the predicament that any discussion about culture at this particular political juncture in India, but possibly elsewhere faces. Um, it's a bit of a reckless task because the talk will be a little bit abstract perhaps. Uh, there will be an implicit politics in it, but you know, I'm sure it's something we can, we, you know, we can, we can, we can dis discuss afterwards. But it just struck me that one of the ways of paying tribute to U URA was to actually think with him and think about some of the questions that his astonishingly wide-ranging critical analysis actually raises um, about this contemporary moment in culture. So in one of his essays, uh, published in this little book, Literature and Culture, which I actually really enjoy, uh, uh, I mean, apart from, of course, uh, you are his novels, there's a very striking sentence. You are a declares, meaningful dialogues are made difficult by our culture. And that's the sentence that stopped me thinking in my tracks. I mean, what, you know, the doyen of modern Kannada literature, the doyen of modern Indian literary culture, saying meaningful dialogues are made difficult by our culture? At one level, that's a sentence with which all of you will resonate, right? I mean, this pretty much describes our cultural condition in a nutshell. Where is the meaningful dialogue on, of our culture? But trying to diagnose why is a meaningful dialogue over culture, right? Why is culture the site of immense hostility, warring factions, miscommunication? That is a slightly harder task. And what I will try and do in the next few minutes is try and use your Anant Murthy's writings, uh, sometimes agreeing with him, sometimes extending his arguments, to try and reflect on this predicament we find ourselves in. And it's a very paradoxical predicament because at one level, it's an astonishing period in cultural activity, not just in India and all over the world. I'm not one of those people who believe, for example, that the quality of literary output has diminished. Uh, there's a lot of nostalgia about the greats, the classics, the great writers. Um, I mean, there's some incredible contemporary writers sitting in this audience in the front row. Uh, it's a time of incredible inventiveness of genres. New voices coming up in almost every literary field, cultural field. Uh, the surge of first generation learners that are coming into our universities and our critical and literary worlds are you know, pushing the boundaries uh, of what were pretty genteel, fixed conceptions of literature, culture, music, art, film. Uh, so at one level, this is an astonishing period of creativity. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I don't want to for a minute take away anything from that fact. And yet, and yet, every time you begin to have a literary conversation, anytime you begin to have a discussion about the state of culture, 
URA's words begin echoing. <laughs> What's the nature of this meaningful dialogue? What is it about our cultural condition that makes this meaningful dialogue difficult? Do we inhabit a cultural world where communication is impossible? We are all going through the motions of language. We say a lot of things. We spin webs of meaning every day. We make claims upon each other. But I'm sure all of you have experienced this sense that there's a yawning gap between what you think you're saying and how what you're saying is actually heard by larger audiences. You sometimes almost feel that you know, you're trying to say thank you to somebody and even that gesture is being read as an insult of some kind. Every act of communication presupposes some stable context, right? Are parameters in light of which an utterance makes sense. Uh, even when there is disagreement, that disagreement is often most productive when there are some background conditions where all the participants at least understand what would count as resolving the disagreement. Right? But think of the nature of our communication in our culture. Everything can be decontextualized and recontextualized in so many different ways that you pretty much begin with the assumption that every act of communication right now is an act of miscommunication. Right? I'm sure that those of you on social media, you can innocently put up a picture, you can innocently you know, quote a classical author. Immediately there are 45 different meanings attached to it. And part of it is because there is no stable referent. It can be decontextualized and recontextualized in ways you could not, in some senses, even imagine. Yuari himself diagnosed this difficulty at two levels. One was a slightly moralistic one, uh, as all, I think, Indian literary figures, all of us Indians typically tend to be. He says, you know, we are too impatient. We are too given, sweep, given to sweeping generalization. We often resort to unproductive metaphysical abstraction. And there is this kind of imperious knowingness that a lot of Indian citizens have. You know, we know the answer to the question before the question has been asked. And, and he actually says something to this effect in these essays. That, you know, there's, there's something about the way we construct ourselves that makes meaningful dialogue impossible. I, I know the answer to everything. But there is a second level which he diagnoses, which is much more serious and much more difficult, and, it, and something that actually goes to the heart of our political condition in ways that, when I first read these essays a few years ago, I hadn't realized. And that's, in a sense, what I'll, I'll try to, in a sense, bring out. One thing that haunted URA's critical analysis of literature, and when he writes on this question, what does it mean to be a writer in Kannada? What does it mean to be an Indian writer? He's not asking a question just about writers. He's actually asking a question about all of us as citizens. What haunted him, of course, personally, was the fact that his literature was often misinterpreted. Uh, there's a passage in one of his writings where he says, I've been accused of being anti-everything. One group accuses me of being anti-Brahmin. One group accuses me of being anti-left. One group accuses me of being anti-Hindu, right? There's, and, and there's no way you can plead not guilty to any of them on one interpretation of his works. But the other thing which haunted him was this very disconcerting and powerful thought. Uh, he says, look, if you look at India, if you look at even any regional culture in India, any subculture, one of the things that strikes you and makes, you know, gives you energy is this incredible plurality. Right? One of the burdens an Indian writer, or not just an Indian writer, anybody who in a sense inhabits the realm of culture in India has to carry is that you are subject to incommensurable worlds simultaneously, right? Incommensurable languages, your Kannada speaker, your English speaker, right? Incommensurable genres, 
what counts as a good protocol of storytelling in one genre, right? completely unintelligible to another genre. Incommensurable social worlds. If any of you ever lecture in an Indian public university, you'll immediately realize what I'm talking about. What does it mean to be in a classroom where there are still students first generation away from bonded labor and students who are thinking, you know, McKinsey even before they have arrived, right? At one level, this is absolutely fertile ground for a writer, right? I mean, this cacophony, this polyphony, uh, uh, the sense of inhabiting all these kind of nether zones between cultures. But it can also produce a certain kind of intellectual vertigo, right? It can produce an intellectual vertigo in the following sense. Which is, once you have plurality of this radical nature, the first question that any critic faces is, what are the yardsticks and standards by which literature is being judged and who judges them? Right? Who, in a sense, creates these hierarchies? But the very fact of plurality creates three dilemmas, and, and this is what without saying it in, in the words that I'm using, I think URA hinges on. The first I've already mentioned, incommensurability. Uh, it can be a literal incommensurability, which is, as many writers in this audience know, the literal challenge of translating one language into another. But the incommensurability of standards about worth, appreciation, canons, when a writer says, I identify with a tradition, under conditions of plurality and identification with that tradition itself will be an arbitrary act, right? What gets included and what gets excluded in that tradition. But the second thing that this plurality does, unintentionally, I mean, this, is, this is one of, you know, the, one of those tragic cases where a very good thing can sometimes turn into its opposite, is that there is a danger that contemplating this plurality leads to a certain kind of flattening of culture. So think of a sentence, for example, from Salman Rushdie, right? Uh, you know, one of the great celebrators of plurality in some ways, right? He says, look, the great pleasure of living in a city like Bombay, inhabiting these different worlds is, you know, you can read Nabokov in the morning, you can engage with the Mahabharat by lunchtime, Right? You can sing a Sufi ghazal in the afternoon. Right? Uh, you can dabble and be an Englishman and you know, engage with Kipling uh, by evening. Hindu gods, Muslim fakirs. You know, and, and in a sense, that's the brilliance of Rashtis, in a sense, capturing of that cacophony in some ways. Right? That you almost have to be inventive to reflect this plurality in the way you think of your surroundings. Right? And this fact is kind of inescapable throughout India, anywhere. I mean, this morning we went for breakfast and, you know, the, the range of cuisines on offer on this one particular street. This is a great thing. And yet, yet, can the aesthetic contemplation of this immense diversity itself produce a certain kind of flattening of our imaginative horizons? First of all, it produces a flattening because these things can be in competition with each other, right? And when you have incommensurable standards of evaluation, all jostling in the same space, now one solution is you might say, look, to each community their own, right? Or to each literary tradition their own. But when you have the kind of intermingling of these cultures and genres that you have in India, that's not a easy and viable option. Or rather, you can exercise that option only by closing yourself up to plurality, creating these kind of artificial boundaries of sense experience, artificial boundaries of what counts as a meaningful engagement with culture. Right? On the other hand, so that's one danger, you close it up. On the other hand, there is this danger right, of being overwhelmed by this polylogy, right? this, this proliferation where everything becomes available to you for consumption in small doses. That's how you, in a sense, signify your cosmopolitanism. Right? 
And one of the things I think Yuval Anand Murthy was very, very conscious of this fact. And, and I actually think it became a burden to his writing later on as well. Is how do you actually navigate this very stark dilemma? Do you just imprison yourself in one tradition, which any thinking self-respecting writer cannot under modern conditions? Or do you just get overwhelmed when you say, look, you know, Mahabharat, Ramayana, Nabokov, all on the same plane. You can all consume a little bit. Right? So the very condition of diversity and incommensurability also creates this anxiety about a certain kind of flattening where all of this becomes available to us, not as a deep tradition that we identify with, but as something just, just available for aesthetic consumption. And the only question then becomes a competitive one, right? Which of these different genres and modes can you actually make visible, right? Who controls the political economies of consumption, the media, the literary festivals, you know, canons of film criticism, all of that to allow these different voices to emerge. And, and this is why I actually think, my personal kind of hypothesis, I'm not a literary critic, why it is so difficult to get a serious, literally critical culture going into India. Because any serious, literally cult critical culture self-destructs the minute it becomes self-aware of, in a sense, its location in this space. But the problem gets even more, and, and, and I think the reason this was haunting for you all is that, you know, this is not something whose origins or source lie in some evil design. It's actually a product of a condition that we would normally celebrate and should celebrate. Now the problem gets even deeper when you come to the problem of language. Uh, everyone knows that India is a unique polity in terms of the way Politically, we have thought of language. Uh, our constitution makers, our political culture, has for the most part tried to find a very creative solution to this question of language plurality. Right? Uh, and frankly, under Indian conditions, if we decided to go like a Sri Lanka option, one single national language, one dominant national language, the country would break up. And this kind of creative engagement with the diversity of languages has deep historical roots. As Sheldon Pollock has argued, this very European idea that somehow the language of the rulers and the ruled must be the same, uh, the very European idea in some senses that uh, the public sphere must be constituted by a single language, that is historically in some senses very alien to Indian thinking about the relationship between language and society. And so at a political level, for the most part, we have negotiated these shoals very well by not boxing ourselves into a corner solution. We've, roughly speaking, creatively fudged the language issue. Right? But there is one other issue about language that we don't pay enough attention to, which I think actually goes to the heart of our politics much more than the question of should there be a single language or should there be multiple languages. That's an easy one to solve. This dilemma is the following. So one of the results of English being the link language, the hegemonic language of government, the hegemonic language of modern modes of knowledge production is that unintentionally perhaps, Pretty much every other non-English language, I use the term vernacular within quotes, people think using the term vernacular itself is inappropriate, it marks a certain hierarchy of languages, but think of it as a placeholder. Hindi, Kannada, Malayalam, Bhojpuri, Maithili, certain extent even Bengali. There is a kind of implicit hierarchy in the way we think of languages. What is unique about the Indian language experiment 
to my mind, is not the fact that there are multiple languages. That's a fact we have dealt with for a long time. What is unique about the Indian language experiment is that there is a certain kind of partitioning of the role of language. So when we think of Indian languages, again I'm using with quotes, English is as much an Indian language now, but when we think of non-English Indian languages, we think of these as languages of the self, the languages of culture, and the languages of identity. Right? That's in a sense what Kannada literary production is, that's what Hindi literary production is. When we think of English, we think of a language of access to cutting edge knowledge. We think of access to a hierarchy of power. Right? And we think of access in some senses to a wider cosmopolitan world. Now, imagine, think of this as the thought experiment, right? And why I think the Indian experiment is, its uniqueness has not been grasped. What would happen over time to a culture? which actually partitions the function of language th this way. I can't speak authoritatively about Kannada, but I can tell you Hindi, right, for all its magnificent literary productions, right, uh, incredible inventiveness in poetry, the novel form, you would be hard pressed to find even the most ardent Hindiwalas defending the claim to Hindi as the site of the production of new knowledge that gets them access to the frontiers of tomorrow's world, right? It's almost in the sense the vernacular is the language of the present and the past. It doesn't give you access to, in a sense, the summit of those hierarchies. Now, when I think of politics, particularly in North India, if you want one simple reason why BJP, just to put on my hat as a political scientist for a moment, actually does relatively well, right? Is that it actually taps into this bifurcation enormously effectively. Can any society in the long run avoid this question of not, as I said, not multiple languages? That is easy for us. We, you know, we can learn five languages, we can create new language forms, um, hopefully most of us not, are not too obsessed by language purity. But this bifurcation, that the language of our imagination, the language of our past, the language of ourself, the language of culture is one language, and the language of knowledge and authority is another language. The resentment, in a sense of the Hindi world, right, is almost a kind of existential resentment. It's not to do with this policy or that policy, right? It's what does it mean to say that we both promote the vernaculars, we both want to inhabit them, and yet somehow they remain languages of the past. Now, in producing this condition, I think the, the establishment of these languages also have a lot to answer for, the way they actually thought of the shape of that language. So when the government of India now says we are going to do medical training in Hindi, in English, we are going to do engineering in, in, in Hindi, sorry, in Tamil and Malayalam and Karnataka, at one level many of us snigger, right? But that sniggering is itself symptomatic of something, right? It's effectively you're saying to large masses of population, the very thing that makes you who you are, the language of your culture in yourself, is not going to be the language of access and power and cutting edge knowledge. And to my mind, I think one of the reasons our dialogues are across this kind of English vernacular divide is, 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 is less productive is because I don't think we have a good pedagogy, pedagogical answer to this anxiety. One possible pedagogical answer is genuine bilingualism or trilingualism, where people can seamlessly function in all languages. Not what we mean by bilingualism, that you can speak two languages. That's not the same thing as being able to think in two languages or produce knowledge or publish papers or give talks in two languages. So the uniqueness of the Indian cultural experiment of this bifurcation, this has no precedent pretty much anywhere else in the world, actually. 
when you can think of French, German, Korean, Chinese. Ambition is to make those languages not just languages of the past, culture, identity, self, right? but language forms in which, you know, some access to the future. How do we think of, of this dilemma? If this, and, and now this dilemma is going to get acute because you actually have the spread of literacy. I think most of us could avoid facing this dilemma all these years because it was a small elite. Even the vernacular elite was a smaller elite. But I can tell you certainly in the Hindi speaking world, but I suspect it's true elsewhere. I think this dilemma is going to haunt us and, and it takes a pathological form in politics. I mean, then the only way in which the claims of a language are asserted is by asserting purity, keeping outsiders out. So the Indian literary sphere in that sense is already marked as a thing of the past in this, in this construction. I think, and I think you are a, somewhere was circling around that idea. That's the bi bifurcated self we don't quite know how to negotiate. The third thing, that makes this dialogue, I'm just adding on to a litany of troubles, sort of, you know, seeing where we are, is, and again, this is a distinction taken from URA's critical writings. He somewhere says that the main axis of political and cultural contestation in India is the contestation between society and nation. Samaj and Rashtra, right? Uh, and if you think about it, both in political terms and social terms, there is something to that insight, right? Politically, sometimes we think, look, no national homogenizing ideology can ever succeed in India because India in some senses is constituted into too many different social groups, these cross-cutting social cleavages, right? that will act as a natural check and barrier against a homogenizing conception of culture. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the center and left politically are deterministic. We actually think this is going to be enough to stop the inroads of some homogenizing project. By society, as I understand it, in URA's conceptualization, it had a very specific connotation, at least in his critical essays. Those of, of you who know his literature more might have a different reading. By society, he meant the general institutionalized norms by which most Indians live, right? There could be norms of social hierarchy like caste, uh, social rituals, right? I mean, the, the, the different ways in which our daily lives, in a sense, are structured by the work of culture. Right? They direct us on certain pathways. Right? Nation is this, in a sense, modern political idea that is trying to disembed us from these inherited identities, these inherited societies we inhabited, right? and make us available as individuals as free and equal citizens for this new national project. But at our current conjuncture, and, and one of the things I think URA was attentive to the fact, and I think there's one way of reading Sanskar, I mean, Sanskar has so many different readings that, you know, uh, I don't want to just impose yet another one. But in 2021, rereading Sanskar, you almost have the sense that the crisis of contemporary culture is not just the conflict between society and nation. Some homogenizing project that will override these diverse existing social pluralities. The crisis and the conflict is much deeper in that the very idea of Samaj and society itself is coming under serious question. So in Sanskar, right, I mean, what is the pathos of the novel in some ways? The first element of that pathos is clearly there's a tradition that has run, come to a dead end, right? Once a particular member of that community leaves that community, right, violates its norms, there is no textual tradition that tells you how to deal with them. 
Like, what do you do with, in a sense, this body? Is he still a Brahmin or not a Brahmin? Right? And this is an existential question for every member of every community, not just Brahmins. Because part of what URA seemed to be saying is if you start measuring people by the axis of purity and pollution, if you're serious about that, if you're literal about that, which of us does not inhabit a social identity that is not already contaminated by something else? So the idea of holding on to a samaj, it's enclosed spaces, excluding people, can only come now through some kind of act of forgetting or violence. But the second element of that pathos, right, is a tradition running into a kind of dead end just because now it's encased in this larger world, is that the anxiety about Samaj comes from two different ends. One is the end where some big national ideological project comes and claims sovereignty over you, right? We are going to homogenize the country, one language, right? We are not going to recognize your customs, your community identities, and so forth. We are going to disembed you. That's one kind of threat, and we often talk about those kinds of threats a lot. But the second kind of threat that is both morally more powerful and in the long run much more threatening to the idea of Samaj is the threat internally. What do I mean by the internal threat? So, one of the strange things, you know, when we get into discussions of liberalism in India, uh, and I think, I think it was very common amongst even secular and liberal intellectuals in India to often say things like, secularism is a Western concept. My dear friend Ashish Nandi, for example, uh, 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 liberalism is a Western concept. Right? Very, very common refrain. But if you actually look at debates in our culture, think of one moment which all of us have experienced in our cultural lives. Uh, you could have experienced it is if you were a child. You could have experienced it if you're a member of any particular community. At some point in your life, you will use a very simple argument against someone. Please don't impose your own norms upon me. Minorities will often say that to majorities, right? Please don't impose your cultural norms on us, right? right? Sometimes parents will say, children will say that to their, to their parents, right? You know, dad, you, do, you, you don't have a right to impose your values on me, right? Very simple elemental experience. Now, what is happening in a sense within all our societies is when people are asking for rights and liberties, they're not actually speaking a language of liberalism in some abstract way. All they are saying is, this very demand that you make on others, can you extend that very same courtesy to all individuals within that Samaj? Right? So if a community says, this is our way of life, you know, we please don't impose your laws on us. An individual within that very same community can ask the same thing. Right? And frankly, that's the core kernel of liberalism. In fact, if you read Sanskar at one level, right, what is the crisis? The crisis is somebody has just asked a question. Can you justify an imposition of a particular kind? But the mere asking of this question is actually dissolves authority. The minute it dissolves authority, it dissolves the idea of Samaj. Or rather, it gets you to reconstitute Samaj as an act of individual choice, not something that can be authoritatively imposed on you. If you look at the debate on Indian culture, I think, right now, in a way, this fault line is probably far more significant and consequential in the long run. It's not just the divide between the majority community and the minority community, or the divide between homogenizing national projects and the plurality of society. When you are being sincere about the culture, you are being true to others. You are being true to the expectations others have of how you should behave as a member of that cultural community. Right? You are, in a sense, conforming to a script. 
So, you know, if in my community you have to eat a certain way, I'm a sincere member of that community if I eat that certain way. Uh, sincerity is always other directed. Right? When we say to somebody, very sincere person, right? I mean, they have in a sense communicated to us the idea that what they're doing in some senses is conforming to our expectations of that. This was contrasted with an idea of authenticity, where the point of culture is in a sense to be true to yourself. Now, in an ideal world, there would be no conflict between sincerity and authenticity. The outer world that whose scripts you have to inhabit to be sincere is exactly who you are and who you want to be. Right? But in practice, in practice, the protocols of sincerity come in the way of the desire for authenticity. Right? If I am sincere about the protocols of my culture, am I actually being true to myself? And this is particularly true at the moment when we actually realize that so many of the scripts of your culture that you were being sincere about were violating something that was very important to you, your particular desires, identities, and so forth. Right? We just can't inhabit those social scripts in the same way anymore. Now, one of the things your Anandati, in a sense, talks about at great length, and uses this distinction a lot, is that the mark of modernity in some senses in Indian literature is this also this transition from a certain kind of sincerity to authenticity. This concern about being true to oneself. Uh, stereotypes. Why do we object about stereotypes? We can object to stereotypes because they stigmatize people, they place people in hierarchies. But sometimes you object to stereotypes because you know they are violating right? something that is important about that person. We are now in a cultural condition, I would want to submit, where actually even the idea of authenticity is in deeper crisis in the following way. So when you say something like, be true to yourself, teachers always say to students, you know, it's a our, it's our famous, the cliched professor, right? Be yourself, right? And I usually, when I hear that, scratch my head and say, I don't know what myself is, right? I mean, what does it mean to be true to myself, right? But there's a distinction there. One conception that I think you are operated with was, that sincerity is a burden because it prevents you from, in a sense, being yourself. But what if this idea of being yourself is also understood very radically? There is no true self for you to be, right? It is a radical volitional idea. I can define myself any which way I want. Uh, Think of the analog of this, for example, in you know, the most contested realm of culture right now, gender. The idea that, in some senses, even gender categories. So, so think of two stages in that argument. One stage in that argument was that prevalent gender norms prevent people from realizing their full potential, right? They subordinate women, they keep them in the private sphere. In some senses, they prevent them from being true to themselves. But now you're at a stage of cultural argument, and rightly so, where this question is being asked, okay, so what does it mean to be true to myself as a woman or a man? Right? It's a much more radical, volitional idea, right? That being true to myself is the ability to completely define the power to name myself, the power to set expectations of what do you actually associate with me, right? And this is something that is created. This is not something that is an objective fact about me, right? Now, under these conditions, debate over culture, the salt over culture, in a sense becomes how do you prevent this kind of radical volitional about culture emerging, where we simply say, look, culture is whatever people define it to be. Identity is whatever people define it to be. 
there are no objective, in a sense, facts of the matter. And this is exhilarating because this also signifies a condition of radical freedom in some senses. Right? That there is no facticity, there is no objective fact that binds you or your identity. Now, I'll submit to you that I think URA's critical interventions, when he said we can't meaningfully discuss culture, I think he was circling around a moment in thinking about contemporary culture, where he realized that the issue is not just that, you know, critics are impatient and full of egos and, you know, there's a political economy of the media. It is that there is something about the very process of the way in which freedom has asserted itself in society that actually makes talk about culture very difficult. What's the solution? What, where do we go? And this is, in a sense, just the, the closing uh, thought here. Uh, URA was tempted by two solutions, at least the ones that I can figure out in his writings. One, he realizes that not only this engagement with authenticity, but an engagement with something deeper than authenticity is going to be an inevitable mark of modernity. Uh, when he writes about Basava, for example, right? I mean, one of the things he says is, look, Basava is a very modern figure because Basava is a figure who recognizes the subjectivity of experience. Right? Basava is also a figure who recognizes that the way you attain liberation in a religious sense is in a sense by eradicating all distinctions and all language itself. But the point about Basava is that this radical voluntarist conception of freedom, I can break off any script or any act of naming that has been imposed upon me, is a moment of redemption because there is the possibility of a transcendence. Right? And, you know, you always says that one of the interesting things is that almost all radical reformers in India, Ram Krishna Paramahans, Narayan Guru, the radical freedom always ends in this moment of transcendence, right? The point where all cultural distinctions cease to matter. Now the problem for culture, cultural critics, is what if you lose any sense of the experiential possibility of that kind of transcendence? So you have this radical possibility of freedom in making and remaking yourself but no moment of redemption and liberation at the end of it. Under those contexts, won't the argument about culture just become an argument about power? And I think the crisis of Indian culture, if you look at the Indian national movement, it was the last generation. I think URA is probably the last in that generation of writers who, despite not being personally believers in some senses, still had a sense of that ontology of transcendence. That this stripping away of distinctions that we ask for in the name of freedom must lead to an experience that can in some senses encompass the whole of the world as its own, right? The divine in some senses is everywhere. Because if that doesn't happen, all you have in a sense is this gaping hole of meaning. Fine, you're free, so what? Uh, the other possibility which he thought of was aesthetic, beauty. Uh, and in some senses, I think he would have been a little skeptical of, I think, this contemporary turn to deconstruct every literary form into relations of power. Because like religion's transcendence, beauty is the only other moment where you could say that the stripping of distinctions right, that we fight over allows you in some sense, is some kind of moment of transcendence. But we are inhabiting a culture, and I think that would have been URA's plea, that the preparation we now need is not these anxieties over are we Western, are we Eastern, are we Kannada, are we Hindu, you know. Right? Because any attempt to answer that question will automatically be an authoritarian attempt. 
Jawaharlal Nehru said it in a beautiful letter to Iqbal. I mean, it's, it's one of the best things Nehru wrote. When Iqbal was arguing about the Ahmadiyas, Nehru asked this question. He says, whenever culture enters politics in the modern world, it almost always takes an authoritarian form. Why? Because it is trying to slip you back into memory, naming, right? hierarchy, social control. And so a radical thinking about freedom and a radical thinking about transcendence will in some senses have to require a politics of overcoming culture, culture not just reproducing its divisions even at a literary and social level. Thank you. May I just uh, call upon Professor Vinod Vyasudu in the audience to please uh, present some books of URA uh, to <laughs> call upon Deepa Ganesh to propose a vote. I want to thank the Rashtriya Shikshana Samiti Trust, especially Mr. D.P. Nagaraj, Joint Secretary and Pro Vice Chancellor of RV University, for giving us this auditorium this morning. Our heartfelt thanks to him. I also want to thank the facilities manager, Mr. Chandrasekhar, and Mr. Dutt the superintendent of Rashtriya Shikshana Samiti Trust. There is not much we can do without the foot soldiers. They make everything happen. I want to thank Ranganath and Nagbushan. I also want to thank Basavraj, Manu who is doing the sound and lights for this morning. And my special thanks to Madhav who has made this auditorium Green and also told me this morning that he has attended several lectures of URA in this very auditorium over the last 26 years of his service. Thanks to all of you for coming here this Sunday morning and make this happen. Thanks to all of you. Good day.